Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. On behalf of the New York State Federation of Lake Associations and the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center, welcome to the webinar today on working with local government to improve lakes and communities. This webinar is part of a series aimed to assist New York's lake associations and local government leaders grow their skills for better lake management. Our experts today will be providing an overview of how to work with your local government to improve your lakes and surrounding communities. New York State Federation of Lake Associations, or NISFOLA, is committed to reaching the, our membership with important information. As it is for all organizations during this time of physical distancing, NISFOLA state and regional conferences have been canceled. This webinar series does provide the opportunity to stay connected and continue to provide important information to our members. If you have any questions about NISFOLA, please contact Nancy Mueller using the contact information shown or visit the website at nisfola.org. NISFOLA is pleased to provide these webinars with our co-sponsor, Syracuse University's Environmental Finance Center. For a little bit about the Environmental Finance Center, our team enhances the managerial and financial capacity of regional and local governments, nonprofit organizations, and local residents to improve environmental infrastructure, services, and quality of life. Our partnership with Ms. Fola for this webinar series is supported under a grant by the Rural Utilities Service, housed in the United States Department of Agriculture. We also want to welcome everyone to view the past webinars of this series. You can access the recordings at the links provided at the bottom of the slide. We will be posting a video recording of today's webinar on those websites listed below. You will be receiving a follow-up email that includes a link to all of these materials. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box at any time throughout the session. We will be holding all questions for a Q&A at the end of the presentations. Registered attendees can receive a certificate of attendance for participating in this webinar today. This webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits or training credits. If you require a certificate of attendance to apply for credit hours, please contact Tess Clark at pclark at syr.edu. And so to jump right in, I would like to introduce our speakers for, today, for today's webinar. We have two presenters with us today. Joining us is Chris Milicek, Senior Project Manager of Aquatics Princeton Hydro and also Jim Cunningham, supervisor of the town of Nelson in New York. So Chris, I welcome you and we'll jump right into your presentation. Hi, good morning all. Um, I'm much like all of you, I'm sure we all wish we could be doing this in Lake George, uh, but unfortunately the, uh, the kitchen table is what it's gonna have to be. So what I wanted to talk to you today about uh, is a project we have going with the borough of Ringwood in Passaic County, New Jersey. And it, it's a watershed-based assessment of the lakes of Ringwood. Uh, next slide. So a, a quick introduction to myself. I'm a senior aquatics project manager with Princeton Hydro, also a NOM certified lake manager. I've been with Princeton Hydro for over 20 years and have over 30 years of experience with, with the degrees you can see there. Next slide. So what I wanted to do first um, is give you a quick introduction to the funding source of this study, because I know uh, a lot of times that's the number one question is, how is this study paid for? And this study is actually done in conjunction with the Highlands uh, Commission, which is a governing body for a certain section of New Jersey. And one of the Highlands main quotes is, because water and other natural resources do not follow municipal boundaries, a regional approach is required to protect and conserve the vital natural resources of the highlands. And this was one of the founding thoughts when the highlands region was uh, developed. Uh, next slide. So the highlands region in New Jersey is 88 municipalities and it covers parts of seven counties. 
uh, the Highlands Water Protection and Planning Act of 2004 created uh, the region. And, and there's two different sections. There's the, the planning region and the preservation region. And essentially what this means is um, any projects going on within this specific region are not only subject to New Jersey regulations, but they're subject to Highlands regulations with regards to development. Uh, the Highlands is a, a much like the Pinelands in southern New Jersey, the Highlands is a pretty valuable resource in terms of groundwater and surface water. And that's why this, uh, this special region was created. Uh, next slide. So the Highlands has a regional master plan. Um, the Highlands Council oversees this plan and it takes a regional planning approach in addition to the home rule approach of municipalities. Uh, it was published in 2008 and the council works with municipalities and counties to implement it and make sure that everything is being followed according to the master plan. Next slide. It's structured around uh, certain planning considerations with regards to ecological value, natural water and agricultural resources, historic, cultural, archeological and scenic resources, transportation, landowner equity, sustainable economic development, and air quality are also brought into consideration. The management planning and guidance specific to the Highlands though is stream restoration, lakes, stormwater, wastewater, and critical habitat, above and beyond New Jersey's typical regulations. This particular uh, project, as I said earlier, is Ringwood Borough, it's in Passaic County, and here's just a, a quick map of the borough itself. You can see quite a large reservoir right smack in the middle of the borough. That reservoir is not a part of the study because it is owned by a private water utility company. However, all the water bodies that are part of the study feed into the reservoir. So it's, it's protection of the drinking water resource as well as the, the uh, borough's surface water lakes. Next study, or I'm sorry, next slide. So the borough itself, uh, it's 100% within the preservation area. Uh, they had plan conformance approved in October of 2011, and that refers to the Highlands plan. There's approximately 2,100 lake acres in the borough, uh, but that does include the reservoir. The Ringwood Borough Council requested assistance through the Highlands Plan Conformance Grant Program, AKA the funding source. Uh, the funding is reimbursement based, and is utilized for planning initiative only. This particular grant was for $91,000. Next slide. So one thing we, we all understand with, with being members of NICEFOLA is, you know, why is there a need for lake management? What are the things that affect things here um, with regards to water quality? You know, these are all your typical lake issues during the heat of the summer algae blooms, excessive plant growth, taste and odor issues, water quality, fishery could be you know, not, not ideal, shoreline erosion, and just all around general poor aesthetics. Next slide. So the, the keys to any successful watershed and lake management plan with regards to this particular study, uh, what our job at Princeton Hydro was, was to introduce not only to the borough, but um, the unique factor of this study is that all the lakes being studied are actually private water bodies. Uh, and as far as I know, in New Jersey, this is the first public-private partnership with regards to a regional approach to lake management. So the, the thing I really wanted to stress right off the bat was getting everybody on the same page, both on the municipal side and the private side, with a lake management and watershed management plan was to, you know, here are the keys, have clearly defined realistic goals and objectives. The key word there is realistic. It's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, to have base management and restoration actions on a property collected technically sound data set. Is the data being collected correctly? Put the plan into action using support and backing of the community membership and stakeholders. And then as you go, review and revise your goals and objectives as based on the results of management and restoration efforts. If a situation or a solution is working great, 
perfect. Maybe we can do that in other places. If a technique is not working as well as you had hoped, it's time to step back, reassess, and perhaps try a different technique. Next slide. So here's a, a quick flow chart we use for successful lake and pond management. You have a data collection phase, you have an analysis phase, you have an action phase. Next. So what we use our data to understand, you know, the role of internal nutrient sources, the role of external nutrient sources. And those two keys are, are prime in this study in that the external sources, the watershed, is where the township, or I'm sorry, in this case, the borough um, really wants to take a look at things. Are there things that the borough could be doing better with regards to uh, non-point source runoff, rain runoff, those types of things. Internal nutrient sources would refer to the lakes themselves. You know, does the lake have a big, for example, an internal nutrient loading issue, you know, that they were not aware of? So the real key with the study is finding out, you know, does the lake have issues? If the lake has issues, what are the sources? Is it external or internal? And then a management plan can be attacked from there. So these are some of the things that, you know, the data gives you the direction needed to properly manage the lake, both short-term and long-term. Uh, next slide. So specific to the Borough of Ringwood project, the scope of work as approved by the Highlands, a historical data review, a watershed model for hydrologic load, pollutant load, an assessment of pollutant removal techniques, could they be hardscaped, such as you know, manufactured treatment devices or best management practices? Could they be a planning um, technique, such as septic pump out? Could it be you know something uh, green infrastructure, you know maybe vegetated swales, something along those lines? But then more importantly, the field component was the water quality assessment. Uh, we're doing a, a baseline of the watershed, which is dry conditions, watershed sampling of all the streams stormwater conditions for watershed sampling, and then the actual lake data. Uh, in this case, there were six lakes. Erskine Lakes, which is upper and lower, Cupsaw Lake, Skyline Lakes, both upper and lower, Lake Reconda, and then finally at the end, a big assessment report. Next slide. The two keys here um, with this study were in a data and collection analysis phase were two, twofold, hydrologic budget and actual nutrient loading budget as based on the watershed. And as I said earlier, the quantification of the nutrient load. Uh, this is the key, especially with regards to the municipality. They want to know what they can do as external sources. Next slide. So the hydrology influences on the lake are, 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 you know, multiple here. You've got mixing, both horizontal, vertical, flushing, residence time, influx and retention of the pollutants and nutrients, sediment infilling, which could lead to dredge issues, development and length of algae blooms with regard to the nutrients, and then success of any restoration efforts, both internal and external. Next slide. So a hydrologic budget, for those who may not know, it's surface water inflow, it's outflow from the lake itself, it's groundwater inflow, precipitation, evaporation, and a calculation of flushing. And this is key with regards to any internal management techniques. If a lake flushes in, say, three days, there are techniques that you cannot use. It just doesn't stay in the water long enough. Uh, but you may have a lake that has a residence time of three years. Uh, and the same thing, there are techniques that you can't use because it doesn't flush soon enough. So calculating the hydrologic budget of each lake is, is key to determining management measures. Next slide. And in the Northeast in general, uh, I'm sure we've all heard this, phosphorus loading. Phosphorus tends to be public enemy number one with regards to lake management and eutrophication. Um, you know, phosphorus load obviously strongly determines the extent of in-lake productivity. Very simple. The more phosphorus, the more algae and SAV growth. Loading can be seasonal, uh, especially with regards to stormwater. Uh, you know, heavier, flashier storms in the summer 
followed by longer, dry, sunny periods can be the perfect combination for, for bad algae and plant issues. And then, uh, you know, it, it, finding out your, your phosphorus load is really the key for a successful diagnostic study, which can then lead to management techniques. Next slide. Sorry, I had to grab a coffee. So when we compute the phosphorus load, you know, we, we typically do desktop modeling techniques, as mentioned earlier. And then we fine tune those models based on the results of the field sampling data. Uh, the field data provides a snapshot of existing conditions. It's not necessarily long-term data. Um, you know, logistics and budget kind of key into that, but the volunteers can come into play there as well. Uh, the model data helps define a big picture and, and it really integrates the lake's physical, biological, and chemical attributes with regards to coming up with a management plan. Next slide. So when we compute the phosphorus load, we account for all external sources, you know, septic, stormwater, atmospheric. We account for internal sources such as internal recycling due to anoxia, plant and algae die off. Uh, we recount for a reduction of nutrient load due to sinks such as wetlands, upstreams, lakes, or ponds that may also be reducing phosphorus. Uh, we take the role of hydrology and seasonality when we, when we load our data into the model, whether it's AV Guelph, Basin Sim, Wiki Watershed, it's basically a great big picture of the annual practices that can uh, you know, affect the phosphorus load. Next slide. So getting to the analysis phase. So everything we, we discussed up to this point was, was collection of data, you know, the diagnostic study. Getting to the analysis phase. Next slide. So when we put the plan together, we base the decisions on the data. We address the short-term and long-term problems. In-lake is typically referred to as your short-term. That could be an algae bloom. Watershed would be longer-term, nutrient reduction techniques. We prioritize the projects, we develop a budget, we develop a realistic implementation schedule, and we make sure the plan is cost-effective. Next slide. The key here is prioritizing your efforts, and in this case, your money. You know, distinguish between the symptoms, which say an algae bloom, and the causes, which could be watershed-based nutrients. Uh, we focus on correcting the causes of the water degraded water quality. We use the data to direct efforts, make decisions. We identify required permits and approvals. This is key. Um, you know, I'm sure in New York, you can fully understand, just as we do in New Jersey, permits and approvals. That's a, a bunch of four letter words with much more letters. Uh, we review to ensure that return on investment and cost effectiveness have been maximized. Next slide. The action phase. Next slide. So the typical elements of a good plan, source control, reduce pollutant load at the point of origin, delivery control, intercept and decrease pollutants before they enter the lake, in lake restoration, use of in lake techniques to correct the cause of eutrophication. Next slide. Setting management goals. Establish goals using easy to understand threshold values. This is key with, with multiple stakeholders. Um, you know, many people who live on the lake or, or the municipal officials may not necessarily understand lake management the way the experts do, obviously. So we want to make sure everybody is on the same page with establishing goals that are easy to understand. They're based on measured water quality data, observations, SAV, mat algae, uh, secchi disk, depths, that kind of thing. Uh, some examples here, clarity, chlorophyll, TP, plant coverage, things that everybody can agree on from top to bottom. Next slide. Putting the plan into motion. Again, making use of the data, listening to your stakeholders. Make sure the plan prioritizes the correction and cause of the problems. And what I wanna say with listening to the stakeholders, for this specific borough of Ringwood plan, as I mentioned earlier, there were six different lakes on the plan, okay? Each lake may have a little bit of a different issue. Each lake's population has a little bit of a different thought on how things can go. But the key here with the borough is that all the lakes 
have formed a, a committee and it's a lake management committee uh, which actually operates under township guidelines. Uh, it's just as the same as if it were the Environmental Commission or the Historic Preservation Commission. Everybody's on the same page under the same umbrella, municipal umbrella, even though the lakes are private. And that's the key here is everybody coming to the table with their thoughts, with their visions, and everybody coming up with an agreement on how things can go straightforward under one umbrella. So getting back, making sure the plan addresses the lake users, develop an implementation schedule, coordinate finance and create budget, that's always a good time, and putting the plan into action. Next slide. Outreach and education, big, big part. And this is where we really, you know, while the, the municipal officials can, can take the lead in something like this with, for example, postings on the website or an email blast, this is where we really count on the lakes committee to go back to their respective lakes and their respective stakeholders with the results of the plan and how things are going to go moving forward you know making sure the action plan is clear well defined setting easily defined goals and thresholds and stressing the need for patience lake management is a marathon it's not a sprint um, you know, you, you definitely plan for the short term and the long term and the long term can be 20 to 30 years. And that's the key. That's part of the message that has to be addressed through outreach and education. Next slide. So, uh, sorry, just a, a few uh, proud sun moment pictures here, but lake and watershed management, it's not a leap. It's an ever changing and challenging climb, but slow and steady gets you to the payoff. And again, I just want to stress that the key with this project is the municipal officials approach the Highlands for the funding. And that first step of the municipal officials realizing we should do this on a regional basis, not just a every man for himself basis, as has been the case, especially with private lakes in New Jersey for many, many, many years that step by the municipal officials to say, let's come up with a municipal based regional approach to lake management was the key to get everything rolling here. Um, it, it's definitely been a model project so far. There's a couple other townships that have gotten on board. They wanna do the same thing. Unfortunately, in New Jersey right now with the, the COVID virus, there's been a spending freeze uh, so we have another project that's ready to go, just needs the rubber stamp of the council, but the council hasn't met because of the virus situation. Um, but I can't stress enough how forefront thinking the municipal officials of Ringwood were to take this approach. Next slide. And that wraps it up for me. Uh, if there's any questions, I don't know if we're doing them at the end or if they've been coming in. Yes, we're going to jump right over into Jim's uh, presentation right now, and then we'll do a Q&A right at the end. Okay. So I would like to, uh, you know, introduce James Cunningham. He is the supervisor for the town of Nelson, New York. So James, welcome, and I pass everything over to you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I serve as a uh, Madison County legislator and the town of Nelson supervisor. I'm the past president of the New York State Feder or New York State Federation Lake Associations and a co-author for Diet for a Small Lake. I'm the president of a uh, clean water management company for 40 years that provides design, build, operate um, programs worldwide for new water treatment systems. And I live on the town, one of the town's lakes. So I'm extremely invested in my community and our lakes. Let's see if I can get this to change. So I just moved to a new lake front property in April and in July it turned into a swamp front, swamp front property when the lake sends you the biggest tax bill you've ever seen. So you get really angry and you want somebody to, to fix it immediately. So this is the sort of things that we see at board meetings quite often. And at the same time, we see residents that are telling me that they are elated by the, all the new weeds in the lake, that it's the best fishing they've ever seen in years, which is completely countercurrent to it some people want. Um, you know, you spend a nice quiet morning on the lake paddling around and it's shattered by, you know, all kinds of jet skis and noise and boaters. 
that uh, that you might not have the same uh, goals or thinking about when you bought your lakefront property. Your stunning view now becomes a giant condominium right next to you. So as a as a government leader, um, it's difficult uh, to deal with a lot of these problems because they're often very complicated. They're often very social. They're long-term projects and and they can be ex very expensive to fix. So what do you do as a as a government entity? You uh, you do what all government enti entities do, and you form a quick committee, and, and you bring in the stakeholders. So that's exactly what we've done. Um, one of the things, as uh, as Chris uh, related to, is that municipal leaders really need to know who the stakeholders are around the lake. Uh, of course, the property owners, only the happy ones. No, you got to have all of them. So there's there's many that are happy and many that aren't happy, and you want to hear all sides of that. And there's lots of other aspects, especially the, the local real estate agents. They, uh, they have a good feel for what people are looking for and, uh, and, and properties around a lake are very valuable to the, to the township. Um, our township is, has a very active lake association, but had no official role uh, with the town board. Um, we met quite frequently um, at uh, board meetings, but we weren't getting a, a whole lot done. And so we formed a town uh, watershed management committee that has two members from each lake association, uh, two board members, and one upland business representative. Uh, other stakeholders also attend those meetings. So our, our, our town has asked the watershed management committee to focus on where are we now, where are we going, where do we want to be, and how do we get there? So one of the first things that we, we we really need to uh, have the group understand is that there are limited funds and uh, limited amount of time that we can do some of the projects. And so we, I underline achievable. So uh, when when they bring projects to the township, that we you know we understand that that we can get these projects done, or we can get funding, or it may be difficult to get funding. Currently, we're we're checking those baselines. We're checking all of our tributaries into the into the uh, end of the lake and to, to determine which tributaries are the have the greatest loading into the lake from a phosphorus and nutrient standpoint uh, we're, we've asked them to take a scientific approach uh, and and to look at the trends new york state does a really really good job with the sea slap program and uh, and sending everybody trends in what direction your lake is headed into um, and also understanding the your watershed and what portion of the watershed uh, it is 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 we were going to want to spend the greatest amount of money on for the greatest impact. So spending in this case, spending uh, uh, all your money on uh, septic systems when it's six percent of the problem is probably not the best bang for your buck. Um, also, what happens around the watershed, the uh, the upland impact, and that's why we have an upland person on our on our uh, management watershed management board. And uh, there's a lot of good data from New York State and the RIBS program that, that you can obtain. So our town board understands that the conditions of, the, of our lake impact property values, recreation, tourism, and an enormous economic uh, driver for our community. So, you know, we're elated to have the water management group um, incorporate their thoughts into our town and of course into our comprehensive plan which is really the the focus of uh legislation for the town uh and land use regulations as well so we've established waterfront zones around our our, our various lakes and uh and we established different regulations for those waterfront zones uh, the town of nelson's comprehensive plan was updated in 2018, and we brought a group of people in from all over the township to uh, to focus on their priorities for for the town and and moving forward and and uh, for the present for preservation and especially of our lakes over time. So our, our comprehensive plan um, lists out specifically items that we'd like to focus on, like septic systems and and landscaping around houses. Etc. So we have now uh, worked that into a our uh, our local water uh, shed management plans and our uh, our codes enforcement. So that's uh, you know that's where the the legislative part meets the uh, the the actual um, criteria. 
So we've also ranked these and weighted these, which I think is an important thing to do so that we can focus on what is most important first. Well, you know, what can local government do? This is a, this is a, um, a checking station for boats that are bringing in uh, uh, invasives once in a while to our various lakes. This is Lake George. We'd all like to have this multi-million dollar system, but not affordable for a small community, but um, certainly a goal, and uh, and we're looking for grants for that kind of uh, 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 help. Uh, how does the town deal with septic systems? Um, uh, what do your regulations look like? We 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 have an inspection program. We have a, a pumping program that sets a frequency, and uh, we we've updated um, our regulations around the waterfront zones so that if a house changes, if someone new buys it, they have to bring their, uh, their, their septic system up to current standards. And of course, it's important that your codes officer uh, is knowledgeable about uh, the waterfront zone and these kind of systems. These systems can be extremely uh, involved today. This is um, testing through NSF EPA program that, uh, that has um, uh, higher tech systems that can remove um, nutrients uh, at a waterfront zone and uh, also, when we allow a homeowner to operate these systems, it often ends in failure. So we have regulations that have a, a certified person operating these higher tech systems. How about phosphorus removal? It's not required right now in, in most um, townships, but there are technologies out there for using sacrificial uh, materials to, uh, to change out, as you can see in the bottom of this, uh, this tub that um, absorbs phosphorus that we can remove and change and replace. So we're we're in the process of uh, mandating those best available technologies as they as they pop up. And of course, uh, bigger projects, bigger lakes, uh, sewer systems surrounding them to to try to to handle that load at a centralized plant. As we all know, larger and larger storms have been causing uh, havoc with um, with our waterways and the amount of uh, material um, that gets washed into the lakes that takes a tremendous amount of time to settle, which brings a lot of phosphorus with it. Um, stormwater runoff is a big issue for townships and losing not only our road surfaces, but you know they end up in the bottom of our lakes. So what kind of codes enforcement uh, does your township have for soil erosion? As you can see here, there's a, um, there's a uh, sediment uh, bag that's that's discharged into for a construction site you know we have these sort of um, requirements in our township check dams our highway department now uh, with every single roadside ditch that we put in with any steepness at all we add check dams to it uh, so that it helps to remove the sediment the important thing is that you have to have accessibility to it this is a, a poorly um, designed uh, area to get uh, uh, excavator into and clean it out. Um, this is a, a system that's in a nearby lake that has a small dam underneath the where this fellow is standing and that holds back sediment and it's a good spot for our excavator for our highway department to pull down in and drain it out and annually clean out the sediment that uh, accumulates over the year. Another area that uh, that local lakes have been uh, looking at is um, wakeboard boats. Um, we're starting to ban these wakeboard boats because they create enormous waves and uh, four to six foot waves sometimes that uh, take out a, a lakeshore owner's property and that doesn't make anybody too happy. Uh, buffer zones. Uh, we have a, a, an ordinance that if you have to get a permit to cut a tree at, in our lakefront zones so that tries to control our, our, our buffering capability uh, better than just cutting all the trees down and having uh, barren ground to the, to the lake. Uh, we've initiated a drone uh, documentation program. So we fly over our lakes with a drone, take photos so we can see uh, property damage. We can see the, the type and amount of uh, uh, growth we've got going on the lake. Um, it, it gives us a good picture from one year to another whether or not we've got uh, uh, more problems in one area than another. Senator uh, Hoffman uh, obtained a grant for us uh, about 
10 years ago to purchase a, a, um, a weed harvester and the, our county currently manages that weed harvester and we go around to lakes to, to harvest um, a, a, for lakes that, that uh, desire to have that um, done for them. Uh, nutrient recycling, that harvest material goes on to farmland and uh, we got a grant for an aquatic weed harvest, harvested material composter and so that's been a really good pro, uh, aspect of the program. And of course everybody talks about salt today and uh, as a supervisor I spend a lot of time riding around with my, uh, my, my highway staff uh, around our lakes to see how much salt gets spread. Um, as an environmentalist before I became a supervisor I was very much trying to get the amount of salt reduced. However, when you become a town supervisor and you think about the safety aspects of, you know, a winter storm and people getting hurt driving to work, um, you really have to balance that um, with safety with with the environment. So we're trying a lot of different uh, techniques. We're trying we've tried a lot of different products, and uh, and the rate that we put it down, but but it, it definitely has changed my mind from the safety aspect as well, uh, just not the environmental aspect. So is it too late to change course? Of course not. I think it's just so important to become a partner with your municipality, as Chris alluded to also. Uh, assign someone from your association to attend every municipal meeting. Um, our watershed management committee uh, uh, has, some, has someone at our board meetings at every meeting. And, you know, and really try not to drop all your problems on the board to solve. Um, it's going to—it's difficult. They've got a lot of different issues, not just the lake issues. So if you can bring possible solutions and cost to that board meeting, it, it'll go a, a lot better, a lot smoother, and you'll get a lot more support from your town board. Financial help. Um, I, 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 if you can, ask your town uh, for a for a line item for their budget for uh, your watershed management committee um, to use. And, uh, and quite a few towns now have those line items. Um, understand um, that municipal government has a fiscal year, uh, usually January to December, but they're doing their budgets in October because the state requires it to be in to the state by October. So don't think you can go to a town board meeting in November and say, um, you know, we'd like to have $100,000 for this project. It's it's probably too late. And villages have a different fiscal year in New York from June to May, so they're working on their budgets in March. Grants and programs are available. The EFP grants, uh, which usually end up into a WQIP program uh, in New York State, but there are lots of grants through DEC, Department of Health, Environmental Facilities Corporation, uh, the list goes on and on, um, and so it's it's a really good idea to look into these grants and see if you qualify or not. One of the things that our township has done is um, uh, we've employed a uh, an experienced grant writer, uh, and uh, it's really paid for that grant writer service uh, many times over. Um, I'm not sure right now with the pandemic uh, the impacts. Uh, going to be in the, in the next few years, but you know we're seeing lower sales tax and and a number of um, impacts from the from the pandemic that are going to have a pretty uh, substantial impact on our communities in the next few years. So private public partnerships work well if the com it's a community driven priorities, uh, the public engagement to capture local knowledge. Uh, best use available science, um, adaptive management, implement and measure. Uh, do not let the consultants drive your goals. Uh, it, this needs to be your plan and your priorities. I see that all too often where a consultant comes in and, and you know, they they may have worked with a project somewhere else in the past and it worked well there and they try to shape it that way. But, you know, really get your st stakeholders involved. Uh, in your specific project, and and it'll 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 be way more beneficial, and the people will be happy when you're done because it's the the project that they want. So your swamp front property with high taxes, you're angry. What's the best course? You know, partner with your municipality and help steer you know towards your goals. I think that's so important uh, to 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 help steer because the most municipalities don't have the 
technical expertise and uh, and uh, you know they re really rely on what your problems are and what your needs need to be. So, but remember that everybody has a wide range of interests. So uh, as a town as a town official, you, know, you have to listen to all of those different uh, uh, aspects and and so it's a balancing act. But um, but you know once we prioritize what what the majority of the people want to do that. I think that's where the town board starts to shape their decisions. And of course, if you approach a municipality with sound planning, that they'll be all years. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jim. I am just going to put up our last slide. So we're gonna jump right into the Q&A. So I know we have quite a few, um, questions that were submitted prior, but you know, please feel free to submit them right now as well. Don't know why I can go through this again, my apologies. But I'm just gonna jump right in. So for the first question. <laughs> Are there ways municipalities can assist privately owned lakes to get New York State funding? You know, this attendee's lake is owned by a private non-for-profit. Well, even though it's owned by a private non-for-profit, um, townships collect a, a tremendous amount of um, property tax. And so um, quite often, if you go to your township, even though it's not, uh, hasn't got a state bowl launch or uh, state involved programs um, the township will help at least discuss and help fund those pro projects if they make sense to the township great the other thing too i just want to add uh the other thing too a lot of times a private lake can partner with a township uh in chasing grant money uh because you know most times the the grant recipient needs to be a nonprofit or a municipality um, you know, so if there's a way for a grant to benefit both the municipality and the private lake, that could be another option as well. Thank you both. To the next question, have local budgets been slashed due to COVID and how will this impact funding for implementation? Is there any special funding dedicated to the project? Well, we recently were have been working on a, um, a trail between our lakes and uh, it was partly funded by DEC, New York State DEC and the town. And uh, and as of last month, the DEC um, uh, pulled back from that funding. So we are seeing that impact already. Uh, we know our sales tax um, has been impacted uh, quite a bit. In our township, there's a, a casino and because a casino has been closed, uh, the revenues that the, the township receives from that will certainly be impacted. And uh, our CHIPS money for road maintenance has, has um, been reduced by 20%. And uh, we're all sitting on the other edge of our chair to see what's going to happen um, in the next, next fiscal year. Down here in New Jersey, the, the money that's been allocated for these studies and these projects um, is still 100% flowing. Uh, and dedicated to the projects. That being said, we're in the same boat where we're waiting to see what's going to happen with future funding. Uh, anything that's currently underway is going to be finished without a problem. Uh, future availability of funding has yet to be seen. Thank you both. So to the next question, who defines realistic or achievable goals? I guess that depends more on the the problem. Um, you know, if it was, say, you had very high phosphorus concentrations and you wanted those phosphorus concentrations reduced or eliminated, you know, in a year, that's probably not a realistic goal. Um, you know, it depends more on on I guess what the specific problem would be in terms of what the realistic goal would be. Yeah, and achievable for a municipality certainly is needs to fit into its budget or 
um, a grant program if we could if we could obtain one. Um, so achievable can be economically achievable, or it could be, you know, time frame too. Is this a ten year project? Is it a two year project? So achievable has many meanings, like Chris said. Thank you. And so, Jim, we had two specific questions for you, and then I'm going to follow up with Chris for his specific questions. So an attendee asked you, Jim, how did you go about ranking your priority strategies slash projects? What was your criteria and who or where did you get input from? Yeah, we formed a, uh, a, a group to work on the comprehensive plan that was made up of a, a variety of different um, residences of the community. And, um, and the criteria and ranking uh, was sent out to um, the entire township to rank from like a one to 10 um, uh, scale for them. And, and we compiled all of that information and, uh, and, and ranked our, um, our ranking for the comprehensive plan based on the, the community and the entire township. We had about maybe a 50% response from the entire township, which, um, which is actually pretty good. So, um, so we we felt pretty pretty good about uh, what we implemented into the comprehensive plan. Great. And then an attendee also asked if you have any knowledge of the status of the government's sixty five million dollar fund to address HABs in New York Summit Lakes. I do not. Not a problem. So Chris, for you, an attendee asked, you know, how do you determine the flushing rate? It's basically a, a series of calculations, uh, but one of the keys with flushing rate is we need a very good detailed bathymetry of the lake. We have to be able to calculate how much water is in the lake itself. Um, and we do that through bathymetric survey or bathymetric study maps, that kind of thing. Uh, and once we determine how much water is in the lake itself, we can then, through the modeling and the hydrology, determine how much water enters the lake on an annual basis. And then it's literally just simple calculations at that point. You know, if, say, I'll, I'll just pull some numbers out. If a million gallons enters the lake every year and the lake itself is 500,000 gallons, you know, obviously it would flush, you know, one to two times a year. Perfect. So an attendee also asked, um, you know, they have a large horse community and there's always some friction between the horse operations, which is mostly a small operation and the protection for wetlands and buffer zones. Mm -hmm. He is just asking, you know, they're always open to suggestions in this area. Yeah, the, the real key, you know, as Jim had said, is sitting down with stakeholders and, and understanding needs and issues um, you know it, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to tell a property owner that they need to reduce you know the edge of their property by 25 to 50 feet to create buffers um, you know that stakeholders paying taxes on that property and and feels that they should use the property as they see fit that being said you know water quality affects x amount of people downstream then you know, you, you kind of have to meet in the middle. Um, I, I do understand, you know, the, the same same problems can occur with agricultural operations in general. Um, you know, it, farmers want to maximize their, their efforts with re how much land they have. So I, I don't have a specific recommendation for you. Um, you know, there, there are things that, it, the first thing would be to reach out and, and see if you can come to the table together and then based on the specific site or the specific property maybe come up with a, a, a series of smaller solutions versus one big solution. In, in Madison County we have a soil water conservation district that has been extremely useful for these sort of um, issues and of course they work with CAFO large farms and um, and also small you know, farmers that um, have input to our lakes. So we've been really successful at working with our local soil water conservation district. Although we just defunded them by 50% because of COVID. 
Thank you both. And so another attendee is located in Columbia County, New York. And within the lake community, there's a resident that is keeping chickens and roosters on her property. And that coop is in violation of local regulation, which states that the coop must be 200 feet from the property line. He's been in touch with the code enforcement officer and the code enforcement officer has, you know, reiterated that the resident will apply for a variance and get it. Um, but, you know, it is causing some disturbance and it's also bringing in more uh, geese and ducks to the area. So the attendee is wondering if there's any basis in law to limit the quantity of waterfowl that a resident can house or chooses to rescue. Chris, you want to take this, or I, I, I've been, in, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, it, I guess it, it's going to depend, again, uh, on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, you know, if the facility, you know, I, obviously geese tend to be public enemy number one with regard to lake communities, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, chickens and roosters, you know, if they're attracting waterfowl, that's that's not necessarily housing waterfowl. Um, I don't know. That's a that's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, there, there's tons of literature as to what kind of impact waterfowl can have on uh, you know lake water quality, especially with regard to nutrients and bacteria. And we know what kind of of lakefront shoreline landscaping will you know, assist in keeping waterfowl away and will invite waterfowl. Um, with regards to the chickens and roosters bringing in the waterfowl, I, I have to admit that's a first. So in our township, we passed an ordinance specifically allowing people that are non-agricultural zoned, um, especially in villages, and um, that they can have a limited amount of um, chickens and roosters. In fact, we don't allow roosters, um, and uh, and um, they have to apply for a permit for those, and um, and if they become a nuisance, um, we pull the permit. So all of these questions that have been submitted by attendees are saved and will be documented. So we'll be able to follow up with some of these more specific questions um, after this broadcast. So moving on, um, and I also just want to reiterate that again, we have had, we're receiving a ton of questions right now. So if we are unable to answer your question live right now, we will be holding a networking session after this call. We'll be providing some more details about that um, after the Q&A, but we will be able to follow up with you after this broadcast. So moving on to the next question, an attendee owns a private lake. There are nine family owned homes around this lake. They want to test the septic systems as part of the lake management plan. Can you recommend any specific tests that they should use? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the question with septic systems um, is fairly straightforward, but at the same time, fairly complicated. Testing the septic system is, is very simple. Uh, and, and what we've done in the past is uh, a very high visible fluorescent dye gets added to the septic system. And then slowly over time, you watch uh, down at the shoreline for uh, infiltration of that dye into the lake waterfront. Um, may not be visible to the naked eye, but there are water quality meters that will detect it at very, very tiny concentrations. Um, that being said, two different things. Uh, the EPA determines that basically any septic system within 300 feet of a lake or stream or riverfront presence is going to have an influence on that water body, even if it is perfectly functioning. Uh, and at the same time, the big question that has come up in our experience is who gives the jurisdiction to go into a private property and determine that you want to test a septic system if there's no clear indication that it's failing? So in, in our township, um we have set regulations that require people, especially if they change, change ownership, to bring the system up to, to uh, current standards. In the waterfront zone, it would have to be an alternate system. 
Um, and so we also require that every five years, the, the municipal, they have to check the system and checking the system means pulling the cover off and looking to see the baffles still intact and that the uh, D box is still intact and that their uh, soil absorption field um, is also functional. So um, we also have a pump out program. So every five years um, you, you have to pump and show us documentation that you pumped your septic system out. Yeah, that, that pump out program is very popular uh, around here as well. Um, most of the communities actually have a three year pump out and same thing, you have to show documentation uh, of the pump out to, uh, in this case, maybe you get your dock sticker or your boat sticker. Um, you, you can't get those lakefront amenities without proof of showing pump out. Great, thank you both. So we have time for one more question before we get ready to wrap up. And that question is, is how can our Lake Association encourage local government involvement in stricter code enforcement to improve water quality? For example, in areas where old cottages are being replaced by new construction. I think that goes back to um, what I just said, our ordinance, is requiring that people that uh, are have changed hands need to bring their septic system up to up to date. Um, also, um, have a watershed management uh, committee have a have a waterfront zone, so you have specific zoning for that zone. Um, all of those things help quite a bit. Yes, yeah, it's, it's same thing here. Uh, many of the lake communities, uh, especially the private lake communities, in conjunction with the township, if a if a waterfront property changes hands, everything needs to be brought up to current code. Um, and this is especially the case with the cottages that were formerly seasonal that might have a cistern or a dry well uh, converting to an actual septic system, even if it's an alternative septic system. Uh, you know, upon that real estate transaction things need to be brought up to current code. Great. Um, thank you both Chris and Jim for being here to provide your expertise for this presentation. I just want to highlight that we will be having a Zoom networking session uh, starting at 11 o'clock and Meredith has pulled the Zoom link out in the chat. So please feel free to join us um, here in a few minutes over on Zoom. All of the questions, you know, that you, maybe you submitted and weren't able to answer live today, you can ask at this session or we will be able to follow up with you via email. I do want to introduce Tarki Heath at this time. Um, she would like to give a few closing comments. Um, so Tarki, I welcome you and take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been a wonderful series. Uh, and I just want to extend uh, appreciation to the Syracuse Environmental Finance Center for all your great work. Um, back in March, it became clear that we were going to, NYSFOLA was going to have to cancel both our statewide and probably the regional conferences. So we reached out to Syracuse University and the Environmental Finance Center just jumped right in and has been wonderful to work with. So thank you, especially Meredith, Savannah and Jess for all your good work. Um, we really appreciate it. I'd also, of course, like to thank our speakers, including Jim and Chris today, but we've had wonderful speakers through the last several weeks uh, that have provided professional uh, information and a wide variety of subjects. So uh, I won't name each one, but thank, thanks to our speakers as well. Um, a special thanks to Nancy Muller, our director, because she's the backbone of this organization. And uh, so Nancy, you're wonderful to work with too, and thank you. We can anticipate uh, that we'll, we'll be working remotely, at least for the foreseeable future. So as members, if you have ideas for future webinars, um, please contact us. Let us know what you would like us to share with you and present to you. Um, and thank you all members for continuing your support and sticking with us through these pretty difficult times. And finally, I hope we'll see you all in the spring in Lake George, <laughs> if things go well, and as we all hope, so stay safe. That's all.
Thank you so much, Tarki. I am going to leave this GoTo webinar open for the time being so folks can access that Zoom link and join us on the networking session. But please feel free at this time to exit out and join us over on Zoom. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. So again, for anyone still on the GoToWebinar platform, please feel free to join us on the Zoom networking session. And that link has been included in the chat box. Um, we will be starting that in about you know three to five minutes after 11. So looking forward to seeing you all over there. If folks are still on the GoToWebinar session, please feel free to join us on the Zoom networking session. The link is provided in the chat box. I will be getting ready to close this session in about a minute here. So um, grab that link within the next few seconds and looking forward to seeing you over there. Have a great day, everyone.